I am the Ukrainian, the native of Kyiv, and now I am on Maidan, on the central part of my city. I want you to know why thousands of people all over my country are on the streets. There is only one reason. We want to be free from a dictatorship. We want to be free from the politicians who work only for themselves, who are ready to shoot, to beat, to injure people just for saving their money, just for saving their houses, just to saving their power. I want these people who are here, who have dignity, who are brave, I want them to live a normal life. We are civilized people, but our governments are barbarians. That's not a Soviet Union. We want our courts not to be corrupted. We want to be free. I know that maybe tomorrow we will have no phone, no internet connection, and we will be alone here. And maybe policemen will murder us one after another when it will be dark here. That's why I ask you now to help us. We have this freedom inside, inside our hearts. We have this freedom in our minds. And now I ask you to build this freedom in our country. You can help us only by telling this story to your friends, only by sharing this video. Please share, share it. Speak to your friends, speak to your family, speak to your government and show that you support us. But Ukraine, geographically, it's right in the middle of a crossroads between two economic superpowers. We have to the west the 28 member states of the European Union and all the promises of trade that they bring. But to the east is mighty Russia. Long cultural ties it has with Ukraine. It also, of course, has abundant gas supplies. Ukraine itself divided. Everyone, well, pretty much everyone is bilingual. But those in the western part, they speak Ukrainian first and they certainly feel closer to Europe. Those in the east... They speak Russian. They see Russia as their natural neighbor. President Viktor Yanukovych, he was voted in predominantly by the Russian speakers in the East. The protests, of course, they began with the president decided not to sign a partnership deal with the European Union in November. Yeah. Since November last year, anti-government protests in Ukraine have engulfed central Kiev. These protests, dubbed Euromaidan, escalated in January when police and protesters clashed over a new and highly controversial protest law. This law could see you in prison for wearing a mask at a protest or even setting up a tent without police permission. 
The fighting lasted for four days and left hundreds injured and at least two dead from gunshot wounds. The clashes centred around Hereshkovo Street on the eastern edge of the Maidan, where new barricades had been set up and a shaky ceasefire was in place. So right now there's thousands of people just kind of watching, looking towards the police lines, waiting to see what happens. It looks like they're just ready for a fight. They're waiting for the police to push forward. And there's a building right, ne right, right next to that, currently barricaded, and that's now on fire too. It's called Lou Jules. There's, there's a man behind me, half naked, wielding a chainsaw. The police are firing rubber, rubber bullets in this direction, so we're having to move. Okay, this is the very front line of the barricades on Horeshkova Street. The protesters are shooting fireworks now towards the police. It's like a post-apocalyptic nightmare down here. It's insane. So the protesters have opened up a corridor on the steps in front of the building. The police inside have surrendered, so they're going to let them out and then retake the Ukraine House. The next day, Ukraine House was firmly under the control of the protesters. On the front line, uh, there is a so-called uh, right uh, sector, and uh, they are of these a little bit violent organisations. Right. So you have paramilitary organisation with military experience on the front lines of the Huron Maidan protests. Uh, yes, but I don't think they're the, the main uh, factor in, uh, in the whole uh, uh, right sector. Sure. OK, OK. Пожалуйста, вот эти офицеры. А завтра, 29 числа, будут круты, будет марш, будут опять коммуняку на Геляку и москалив на ночи. А это следы камней, железных палок, битые. Битые, гнутые щиты.
We have been actively engaged in what's been happening in the Ukraine. Uh, uh, not only has our embassy and our folks who are over there been uh, talking to the opposition as well as the government, but uh, folks uh, like Vice President Biden uh, have spoken directly uh, to President Yanukovych about our belief that, number one, uh, rules that restrict protests and free speech uh, are ultimately counterproductive and uh, we are uh, very much against. Number two, that uh, there has to be a way to restructure the Ukrainian government in a way that allows the voices of the opposition uh, and those folks on the streets to be heard uh, in preparation for some sort of democratic process that uh, creates a government with greater legitimacy and unity. Uh, and that's going to be challenging, but we're trying to help on the negotiations on that. It's very hard for uh, countries to engage in an old-style politics that doesn't take into account uh, the, the genuine hopes and aspirations of ordinary people because with uh, the Internet and smartphones and uh, Google and uh, technology and information, uh, you know, people want to be part of determining their own destiny. And you can't bottle up information in the same way that you used to. And uh, hopefully uh, those in power in Ukraine are going to recognize that and we can get this resolved peacefully. I'm always worried about the violence, but uh, as I said, we're, we're, uh, we're engaging uh, on a daily basis with the Ukrainian government to make sure that uh, we get a positive outcome there. Russians have repeatedly accused the United States government of interfering in Ukraine's politics. Mm -hmm. The U.S. government has to some degree made reciprocal claims about Russia. Um, does not the fact that U.S. diplomats uh, purportedly are discussing who should and should not be in a Ukrainian government uh, hint at some possibility of U.S. interference here? Absolutely not. What do you think? Uh, I think we're in play. Um, the the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here, um, especially the announcement of him as Deputy Prime Minister. And, and you've seen some of my notes on the troubles in the marriage right now, so we're trying to get a read really fast on where he is on this stuff. But I think your argument to him, which you'll need to make, I think that's the next phone call we want to set up, is exactly the one you made to, to Yachts. And I, I'm glad you sort of put him on the spot on where he fits in this scenario. And I'm very glad he said what he said in response. Good. So uh, I don't think Cleet should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. I think Yachts is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleet and Tony Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week. You know, I, I, I just think Kleech going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk. It's just not going to work. Yeah, no, it, I, think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay. When I talked to Jeff Feltman this morning, he had a new name for the UN guy, Robert Seri. Did I write yeah. you that this morning? Yeah, okay. I saw that. He, he's now gotten both Seri and Ban Ki-moon to agree that Seri could come in Monday or Tuesday. Okay. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it and, you know, fuck the EU. No, exactly. And I think it shouldn't be a surprise that there are discussions about events on the this ground. This was more than discussions, though. This was two top U.S. officials mm -hmm. that are on the ground discussing a plan that they have to broker a future government and bringing officials from the UN to kind of seal the deal. This is more than the U.S. trying to um, make suggestions. This is the U.S. midwifing the process. Well, Elise, you're talking about a private diplomatic conversation 
Those happen all the time. Of course, as part of private diplomatic conversations, there are discussions about what involvement the UN can have, what involvement or engagement should happen on the ground. That shouldn't be a surprise. Of course, these things are being discussed. It doesn't change the fact that it's up to the people on the ground. It is up to the uh, people of Ukraine to determine what the path forward is. There is a difference between private discussions that happen in the interagency process, in the building, and what we convey publicly as a U.S. government. And we have a responsibility to convey what our position is. Of course, you're discussing a range of options on a range of issues. But if you That's what you do as, as, it, I'm sorry, as a diplomat. If you're saying privately behind the scenes that you're cooking up a deal, and then you're saying publicly that this is up for Ukrainians to decide, those are two totally different things. I understand that diplomatic discussions are sensitive and you don't want everything to come out, but those are two totally different, totally different positions. Elise, what do you think happens behind closed doors when people are discussing issues internally through this the interagency? This is not discussing issues. This is talking about a deal that the U.S. was cooking up. But we hold the Ukrainian government primarily responsible for making sure that it is dealing with peaceful protesters in an appropriate way, that uh, the Ukrainian people are able to assemble and speak freely about their interests uh, without fear of repression. And that includes making sure that the Ukrainian military uh, does not step in to what should be uh, a set of issues that can be resolved by civilians. And I do think there is still the possibility of a peaceful transition uh, within Ukraine, but it's going to require the government in particular to actively seek that peaceful transition, uh, and it requires the opposition and those on the streets uh, to recognize that violence uh, is not going to be the path by which uh, this issue will be resolved.
Back down in Independence Square, two Cossacks beating out a constant drumbeat by the barricades. They're still arriving here to sign up. More volunteers marched off to join the cause. Coming back the other way, members of the People's Self-Defence awaiting orders outside the Ministry of Agriculture. The man on the left armed with a mace. It was just up the road from here that yesterday much of the shooting took place. But many of these protesters have been working throughout the night to rebuild their barricades, their front line. And this is the third time they've done it. And when you talk to them here, they are absolutely determined that the president stands down and stands down quickly. In the parliament, government and opposition MPs had to be kept apart. But whilst they were lunging at each other, a group of EU foreign ministers was shuttling back and forth, negotiating a deal to end the violence. Finally, after marathon talks, the two sides signed. The opposition had been warned by an EU minister that the alternative was martial law. So a deal was agreed, ushering in new elections, a coalition government, and a reduction in the president's powers. I'm satisfied that it's the best agreement that could be had and that it gives Ukraine a chance to return to peace, to reform and to hopefully resume uh, its uh, way towards Europe. But when the opposition leaders returned to Independent Square, there was no celebration. Vitaly Klitschko, one of the leaders, was drowned out with boos and cries of traitor. Yes, Ukraine has an agreement, but not much trust on either side. Gavin Hewitt, BBC News, Kiev. Ukraine's opposition leader Yulia Tymoshenko has called for continued demonstrations in the Ukraine capital. Her powerful and passionate plea for further protests against the ousted President Viktor Yanukovych capped an extraordinary day of events. It came hours after Parliament approved a measure allowing the former Prime Minister to be freed after spending 30 months in jail for abuse of power. We must do a few important things together. Firstly, we have to ensure that Yanukovych and all that garbage around him are brought here to Maidan, she said. Protesters and many Ukrainians um, have no faith uh, left in uh, politicians' words. So that's why protesters uh, basically in mass decided to stay in, on Independence Square and uh, all around other, um, you know, protest sites uh, in the country to control of what is happening in new revolutionary parliament and to control this very delicate process of forming a new interim government and the way to the new presidential elections in May. Vitaly, can I very quickly just ask you, do you know where Viktor Yanukovych is right now? It's a good question. Millions of Ukrainians uh, want to know where is Yanukovych and try to find him. He disappeared. Uh, president of Ukraine disappeared. Uh, that's why we have to elect a new one. You signed an agreement with the president, or with Viktor Yanukovych, on Friday that he could stay as president until early elections. What went wrong? Because he disappeared. He doesn't feel everything, all points, what uh, we signed. It was uh. so high temperature on society and we have to stop that and right uh, and in constitution way in constitution majority in parliament we want uh, to move to constitution 2004 and after that we try to find him holiday in uh, in evening we decide to uh, announce new president election in ukraine power was taken by nationalists uh, fascist youngsters. I just moved from Kiev to the city of Kharkov. And during my uh, traveling, when I was still in Kiev, I was shot at 
from the automatic rifles. I never gave any orders to the uh, police to shoot. You know that the police was unarmed until the last moment, until there was the danger of their death. I'm sure that there will be time and there will be truth. Truth will win and everybody will know the truth. We left the hotel and ventured up towards the new front line. The majority of the gunfire seemed to be coming from police lines. But not all of it. From one of the upper windows of the hotel, a shot rang out. Up there, okay. Yeah, our hotel. That window. One, two, three, four, fifth row from the left. Second from the top, one that was open. I saw the shooter. He was wearing one of the protesters' green helmets. Hello. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm fine. Good. And you? I'm good, good. I just wanted to catch up with you on what you thought when you were there. My, my impression is in this and sad that uh, there is, well, no trust uh, towards also these politicians who will return now to the coalition. The, uh, well, people from Maidan and from civil society, they say that they know everybody who will be in new government. All these guys have dirty past. Yeah. Because the region's party also said that, well, you will see that if the people from the eastern part of Ukraine will, will really wake up and, uh, and, and, and will start to demand their rights. Some people also with me, they were in Donetsk. Their people said that, well, we can't wait how long still the occupation of Ukraine lasts in Donetsk that it is real Russian city and we'd like now to yeah. uh, to see that, uh, well, Russia will take over, so that, well, yeah. sh sh short impressions. Then second, what was quite disturbing, the same Olga told that, well, all the evidence shows uh, that people who were killed by snipers from both sides, among policemen and, and people from the streets, that they were the same snipers killing people from both sides. Well, that, yeah. That. So that, and then she also showed me some photos. Uh, she said that has medical doctor, she can, you know, say that it is the same, same handwriting, the same type of bullets. And it's really disturbing that now the new uh, new coalition that they don't want to investigate what exactly happened so that there is now stronger and stronger understanding that behind snipers they were it was not Yanukovych but it was somebody from the new coalition I think they do want to investigate I mean I didn't, I didn't pick that up that's interesting gosh yeah so that it was in this sense disturbing that if it starts now to live its own life very powerfully that it, it yeah. already discreditates from very beginning also this new coalition in place of the defiant speeches, the somber strains of Beethoven now ring out over Independence Square. This revolution is moving into a new phase. But amidst the flowers and the children's tributes, flashes of something more sinister. Groups of armed men strut through the square with dubious iconography. That yellow armband is a Volksangel, a German symbol used by several SS divisions during the Second World War. Far-right graffiti is appearing, daubed on the walls of the city. The people who brought down the government were overwhelmingly ordinary Ukrainians, students and doctors, workers and even families, people who simply refused to back down. But the most organized and perhaps the most effective were a small number of far-right groups. When it came to confrontations with the police, it was often the nationalists who were the loudest and the most violent. 
A group calling itself the Right Sector is perhaps the largest. Its members can be seen marching around Kiev in columns of about a dozen. Mostly they carry baseball bats. Sometimes they carry guns. We met these men posing for pictures outside the burnt-out remains of what was once their headquarters. I asked them about their political beliefs. National socialist thematic. Sometimes in some people she is a nation. Но не у всех это, это не заложено в основе этой организации, это у некоторых людей есть. А у вас? У меня лично есть. В смысле, объясните. Ну, мне как бы нравится эта идея единой нации. Угу. Я, я хочу, чтобы ну, нация была единой, я, чтобы э, один народ, одна страна, одна нация. А это подразумевается что? Что? Ну... Как бы, чтобы чистая нация. Ну, не то, что там, как бы у Гитлера как было. Ну, в своем роде немножко, ну, маленько, но было, чтобы своя нация. What about the East, I asked. What about Crimea, where many Ukrainians feel close historical ties to Russia? Кто хочет, кому нравится Россия, пусть едут в Россию. Украина будет только для украинцев. We got a late-night phone call from another group known as C-14, inviting us to meet their leader at their new base. It turned out to be the former headquarters of the Communist Party, now occupied by the far right. It's our general mission to totally ruin uh, chains that connect our country with the uh, imperial uh, power uh, from the past. And that being Russia? Yes, we can do Russia, not only Russia, so Soviet Union. Are you a Nazi? Uh, no, I don't think I'm a Nazi, I'm a Ukrainian nationalist. And what does that mean? The main confrontation is uh, about that some ethnic groups uh, have uh, control uh, many business structures, some economic, some political forces. And, uh, Which ethnic groups? Uh, 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 Russians and Jews and the Poles, it may be uh, every, some uh, non-Ukrainian group control a huge percent of some economic or political uh, power. And uh, of course in this situation uh, Ukrainian people have uh, some uh, tension between it and it causes uh, conflicts. Mr. Karas says his group consists of around 200 men. C-14 is affiliated with a political party called Svoboda or Freedom which now controls four ministries in the new government, including the Ministry of Defence. The fervour of the revolution is beginning to fade now. People are starting to move on. But it's clear that it was the radical groups who kept up the pressure on Viktor Yanukovych, and many of them feel that this really is their victory. The question is, how much power will that give the far right in the new Ukraine. In the former Soviet Republic Ukraine, controversial video has surfaced showing the reburial of Ukrainians who fought for an SS division during World War II. And the reburial was sanctioned by church officials and overseen by officials dressed in Nazi uniforms. Ethnic Ukrainian nationalists wore helmets with swastikas and uniforms marked with Third Reich eagles during the service for 16 members of the SS Division Galicia. The ceremony took place in the village of Holohori in Ukraine's western Lviv province. Some veterans were present. During a salute over the grave, costumed reenactors used wartime era rifles to fire a salute as their leader gave commands in German. Priests looked on, and later in the ceremony, Oleg Pankevich, a member of parliament for the political party Svoboda, which has a faction in parliament, called on Ukrainians to stand up as a nation and to resist outside oppression. The SS division Galicia is controversial in Ukraine because it was drawn from the west of the country, which is mainly populated by ethnic Ukrainians, many of whose grandfathers fought on the side of Germany during World War II. The east and the south of Ukraine is heavily Russian-speaking, and during World War II, both ethnic Russians and Ukrainians from those regions fought in the Red Army for the Soviet Union. And that is why wartime loyalty remains a political flashpoint in modern Ukraine.
Seems like there's a lot of pro-Russian sentiment here. It's hard to tell whether it's genuine or whether these people have just sensed that the winds of change are coming through town. I really wouldn't want to be the Ukrainian soldiers standing behind this gate right now. They're a lot worse equipped, they're cut off from the mainland, and they're surrounded by Russian special forces. So we're just driving up to uh, Ukrainian naval command. We're trying to get into the base to meet with the uh, Ukrainian naval officials, but uh, some pro-Russian uh, people have encircled the base, and the naval command inside, they've told me over the phone that they think that they're being stormed at the moment. So we're going to try to get in from another entrance. Russia! 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 It's really surreal at this naval base because the Russians have come in and they've occupied Crimea. They're here with their army, but the Russian soldiers and the Ukrainian naval officers, they seem to be getting along. It's like the chillest occupation I've ever seen. Now you've called this an invasion. So what are the costs? Well, we're now discussing all of the options. This is an act of aggression that is uh, completely trumped up in terms of its pretext. You just don't invade another country on phony pretext uh, in order to assert your interests. Well, but what there are ways. There are ways to deal with this, and and uh, President Putin knows that. If it is in hard times, Ukraine is left on its own and is given to Russia. And uh, it, when Russia is allowed to take away Crimea, then the world will change. Uh, we can't afford this in the world. That's why if uh, the instruments of diplomacy won't work, uh, if all negotiations or uh, instruments won't work and personal relations uh, with Mr. Putin won't work, uh, the world has to uh, apply strongest uh, means. Ms. Timoshenko, you sound like you're raising the stakes and you are calling for the West, the United States, Britain, Europe, to use military force against Russia. Am I reading you correctly? Is that is what you're calling for? I am asking all the world, personally, every world leader, to, uh, to use all the uh, possibilities in order to avoid Ukraine losing Crimea. Under former President Yanukovych, one woman who pleadingly said how poor they were, how the, the rich lived well and how those in power took the money and how they were left behind. These uh, brave Ukrainians took to the streets in order to stand peacefully against tyranny and to demand democracy. So instead, they were met with snipers who picked them off one after the other. They raised their voices for dignity and for freedom. But what they stood for so bravely, I say with full conviction, will never be stolen by bullets or by invasions. It cannot be silenced by thugs from rooftops. It is universal. It's unmistakable. And it's called freedom. So it's time to set the record straight. The Russian government would have you believe it was the opposition who failed to implement the February 21st agreement that called for a peaceful transition, ignoring the reality that it was Yanukovych who, when history came calling, when his country was in need, when this city was the place where the action was, where the leaders of the nation were gathered in order to decide the future, he broke his obligation to sign that agreement and he fled into the night with his possessions, destroying papers behind him. If it wants to help protect ethnic Russians, as it purports to, and if they were threatened, we would support efforts to protect them, as would, I am told, the government of Ukraine. But if they want to do that, Russia could work with the legitimate government of Ukraine, which it has pledged to do. But if Russia does not choose to de-escalate, 
If it is not willing to work directly with the government of Ukraine, as we hope they will be, then our partners will have absolutely no choice but to join us to continue to expand upon steps we have taken in recent days in order to isolate Russia politically, diplomatically, and economically. We are working closely and will continue to work closely with the IMF team and with international partners in order to develop an assistance package to help Ukraine restore financial stability in the short run and to be able to grow its economy in the long run. I'm pleased to say that this package includes an immediate $1 billion in a loan guarantee to support Ukraine's recovery, and we are currently uh, working with the Treasury Department of the United States and with others to lay out a broader, more comprehensive plan. Good afternoon. The Secretary General and the Prime Minister will make short statements, and then they'll be happy to take a couple of questions. Secretary General. Good afternoon. Prime Minister, it's really a great pleasure to welcome you to uh, NATO uh, headquarters. Um, Ukraine is uh, a valued and long-standing uh, partner uh, for NATO. Um, in these uh, difficult moments, NATO stands by Ukraine. NATO stands by the right of every nation to decide its own uh, future. We call on Russia to withdraw its forces to their bases and to refrain from any interference elsewhere in Ukraine. We are committed to resolve this crisis only peacefully. And it's clear that no military option is on the table. But it's clear that it's up to Russian government to make the step back. I would reiterate again that this is the responsibility of the Russian government. They've started this. They need to put an end to this. Uh, I passed uh, an invitation to the North Atlantic Council to visit Kyiv, and it would be great if you have a meeting in Kyiv. We believe that we need to enhance our cooperation and. Uh, we would be grateful if we get some kind of additional support in technical support, humanitarian support, uh, in uh, improving Ukrainian defense and security system on the technical level. So this would help uh, us uh, to stabilize the situation and to maintain peace and stability in the region. Over there. Over there, sir, Reuters Television. Uh, one question to Prime Minister Yatsenyuk. Um, on a day like this, do you believe it's the wisest thing to pay a visit to NATO headquarters? Is that a sign or a signal for de-escalation? And the second thing is, are you, is your government planning to apply for NATO membership in the near future? It's very reasonable to visit NATO headquarters and to deliver a strong message that we do not consider a military option as an exit strategy from this ongoing crisis. And this is the reason why I asked Secretary General to have this meeting. We still believe that we need to do our utmost to tackle the crisis with the political and diplomatic tools. And NATO, as a, one of very important political vehicles in fixing the global security crisis could be very helpful. It's not on our radars. It's Sunday, the big day of the referendum, the day Everybody in Crimea has been waiting for for all of two weeks. Some people would say that maybe two weeks isn't enough time to prepare a national referendum about separating for the, from the country that you've been a part of for the last 70 odd years. Um, but uh, it's happening today and here we are.
is a pretty busy polling station. We're in the middle of Simferopol, the Crimean capital. People are coming in, casting their ballots. They've got clear ballot boxes there. The uh, elections commission at that end and the lists of voters over here. This is like a local school, but they've got ballots open all over Crimea right now. According to the Ukrainian Central Authorities and the international community, this referendum is completely illegal and an act of separatism. But I think the people here in Crimea really don't care. А за кого вы, то есть за что вы проголосовали? За наших. Что это значит? За Россию. Почему? Потому что они лучше, чем Украина. А, да? Конечно. И вы надеетесь на что теперь? На лучшее. За соединение с Россией как бы. Почему? Ну, Украина сейчас в нехорошем положении при власти шайка преступников, на мой взгляд. Собрали вокруг себя быдло и пытаются как-то восстановить власть. За Россию. За Россию. А почему? Ну, потому что я хочу, чтобы... Да, потому что мы русские. Я хочу, чтобы мы были с Россией. Значит, все 20 лет я говорил жене, небо дожить только до того времени, когда... Крым вернется в Россию, она говорила, да кто же его отпустит, ты никогда не до этого не доживешь. И вот моя мечта сбывается. Но я хочу сказать, вот, значит, вчера я по программе АТР, значит, видел выступление Чубарова. Значит, он вот буквально сказал, что это клоунада, это цирк, и крымско-татарский народ в этом цирке участвовать не будет. Этим он оскорбляет не только меня, а и Верховный Совет, который инициировал как он сказал, клоунаду. Какая клоунада? Я что, пришел сюда к... как клоун? There's a couple of Russian soldiers here, and this is the first time we've seen any Russian soldiers in the center of Simferopol. Because they don't wear any insignia, they've put on white armbands so that they can identify themselves uh, from the other soldiers milling about. По первому вопросу, вы за воссоединение Крыма с Россией на правах субъекта Российской Федерации получено положительных ответов 95,5%. Мы земляки Великой России! Since the beginning of the Russian invasion, this is the day these people have been waiting for. They've just announced that enough people have voted for the referendum to count, and there's no doubt in anyone's mind here that the vote has been for joining Russia. These guys say they're self-defense forces. I haven't seen these uniforms before, this is new. Now that the Crimean parliament has officially requested that Russia allow it to become a Russian region, it's up to the Kremlin and Moscow to decide when Crimea becomes Russia. Я уже говорила, губа треснет у них. У всех 28 стран и у той страны Америки. И поперек горла станем. Мы, мы не дадим. Мы все русичи. У нас одни корни, у нас одна история, у нас одни беды, одни победы. Мы все, у нас генетически мы русские все. Мы русичи, мы святая православная Русь. Что еще им рассказать? Больше ничего. Больше ничего. Ну пусть сидят там, ну, а часто... то научим лапшу, лапшу и лаптями хлебать. Лена, Они лапшу. давно не нюхали сапух русского солдата. Забыла? Лена, тормозни. Подождите, забыла. Тормозни. Тормоз... Crimea is not fully Russia yet, but it is feeling more Soviet because according to the official results of the referendum, 80% of the population turned out to vote and fully 97% voted to join Russia. Given that there's 13% Crimean Tatars here and 20% Ukrainians, that's a pretty questionable result. Как называется эта страна? Armored vehicles and visible anxiety as Russian troops storm a Ukrainian airbase in Crimea. 
one vehicle rams against the gate, attempting to force its way in. The footage comes to an abrupt halt as a man in military uniform dismantles a Ukrainian military camera used to film the scene. Witnesses reported hearing gunfire. A Ukrainian serviceman was reportedly injured in the takeover, and a base commander was detained for talks. Yeah. The Belbek Air Base was one of the last military facilities in Crimea still under Ukrainian control. But on Saturday, Ukrainian soldiers sang the national anthem for the last time. For Russia's supporters, however, it's a welcome change. Kiev insists that Crimea's bases are still formally under Ukrainian control, although most are now occupied by Russian troops and fly the Russian flag. Так я вчера сказал, что если, не дай бог, возникнет военный конфликт, я выступал в свободе слова. Я говорю, если, не дай бог, возникнет военный конфликт, я офицер запаса, и мой старший сын офицер запаса. Мы возьмем оружие и пойдем защищать страну. Послушай, она тоже переходит все границы вообще. Блин, надо брать оружие в руки и идти мочить этих, блин, кацапов чертовых вместе с их руководителем. Я скажу тебе. Просто жалею, что я не могу сейчас находиться там, и что я не, не, не возглавляла все эти процессы, и они у меня Крым получили. Я бы нашла, как замочить эти И я а, надеюсь, знаешь, что я включу все свои связи, и я подниму весь мир, как, как только смогу, для того, чтобы, блин, просто от этой России не осталось даже выжженного поля. Ну, я тебе скажу, что я, конечно, тебе здесь союзник, не просто союзник. И э, я хочу тебе сказать, что вот мы сегодня говорили, а что, э, я, это утром было совещание глав фракции, э, и потом я с Виктором говорю, Витя говорит, а что теперь делать оставшимся 8 миллионам русских, которые остались на территории Украины? Они же сгои. Блин, их растуливать из атомного оружия. Смотри, э, ну это, это, это я с тобой как бы не могу спорить, потому что в том, что произошло, это, конечно, ужас. Но вырисовывается следующий вариант. Потому что сегодня есть действия, которые, безусловно, незаконны. Эти незаконные действия надо разбить в каком-то юридическом, международном... Мы идем в ГАС. Мы идем в ГАС, международный криминал. Блять, надо ментов вызывать, ебаный. Хорошо, да, добрый как. 